Now, I'm an actor, not a director, but for me, there are really sort of two fundamental styles of cinematography that I would put into the category of ways I would work with my DP to shoot a film. And, well, maybe to no one's surprise, they both involve a lot of creative, subtle, and efficient wonders. I've talked about both these styles before. The first is a handheld camera that remains at all times very fluid, organic, not necessarily precise on its surface, but deceptively and impeccably well rehearsed, just as much a part of the action as it is a witness to it. This would be stuff like Alien, which I talked about recently, Children of Men, or really anything shot by Emmanuel Lebesky, The Nick, which I'll be delving deep into in November, or Victoria, the one-shot wonder out of Germany if you want a really extreme example, where the camera is a character, a voyeur, dirty, naturalistic, visceral, and at times even uncomfortable to watch. And the other category is what I would compare to a game of chess, calculated and methodical, always thinking three steps ahead, but prepared to pivot before a particular strategy becomes exhausted, obvious, or predictable where movements are clean and sophisticated, and cuts to new frames are considered and done with purpose. This would be something like Unbreakable, which I've talked about, the films of David Fincher, or, and the film I'd like to focus on today, Ari Aster's Welcome Midsommar to Horga from 2019. And happy Midsummer. As with what made Fincher famous, Ari Aster as a director is very, very meticulous. He knows what he wants and how to get it. And the first thing Astor wants, like any good director, is to control our perception. And this comes right out of the gate with the very first non-establishing shot of the film. Please leave a message after the tone. The camera remains locked onto an answering machine. We don't cut to Danny on the other end of the line. We're not directly introduced to her visually. Not until after we get this eerie track over to her parents, whose still bodies lay the foundation for a presentation of ambiguous information employed later on in the film, and it's finally time for the shot to end. The next major character too, Christian, is introduced to us in almost the exact same way, not directly, but indirectly. Did we talk about doing something tonight? Over the phone, over an extended long take, a take not of himself, but of the person he's talking to. And then, when each character is physically introduced to us, Notice how even their faces are revealed gradually. It's that methodical revealing of information that drives the anxiety we're meant to feel in these opening scenes of Midsommar. But keep that all in mind, because that strategy is going to change as the film progresses. The drama of a scene will dictate its blocking. The blocking will dictate the movement of the camera. But while those moves do tend to be long in this movie, the camera will cut when it's time for something or someone to be introduced, or if a shot simply has nowhere interesting left to go. The first 2 minutes and 45 seconds of this scene is one of the best single shots in the movie. Now, there are a number of scenes in Midsommar that utilize mirrors to avoid shot reverse shot cutting. Hey guys. Hey. Yo. Hey. But here, the camera is able to make a full 180 degree journey from the door, to the desk, to the couch, before the technique exhausts itself, the dynamic in the scene needs to shift, hey. and we revert to normal coverage. Overreacted, I'm sorry. So while the one-shot decision can be strong, here it doesn't necessarily dominate. And if anything, the use of standard coverage in a scene helps to elevate the power of the one-shot when the two things are side-by-side side and well-balanced. Which, as we can see, can split the other way too. That first scene of Danny, after leaving the message, actually starts off with a considerable amount of cutting, especially considering she's a single character on her own in a room. But this sets up a palpable contrast when the scene transitions into a conversation with Christian, what ends up being a two and a half minute phone call with no cuts and no camera moves. But so far, we've looked mainly at the first act of the film, because after that is a transitional point, thematically, photographically, demarcated by one of the most interesting and complex camera moves ever. This is when we enter the twilight zone. This is Alice going down the rabbit hole. It's a long move and a moment as an audience we simply can't ignore. 
And as Midsommar moves from the dark, cold dysfunction and isolation of the American segment to the bright, hot, wide openness of Swedish summer, we see a transition in shot types too. We see a change from tighter, traditional 5K 35mm lenses to wider 8K 70mm large format. We see a transition in the way indirect perspectives and secondary focuses within a scene are presented, no longer about what's outside the frame, but what's inside. No longer about isolation, but about collectiveness, cult psychology. We have bigger shots, more characters, more elements in play vying for our attention. Notice the backgrounds in this movie, the dueling stories and dynamics going on at once, and the challenges also that come with it. You have dozens of extras on screen almost always, a lot of bodies, a lot of movement, shooting in big environments, a wide open field, large open structures, all on location, under the sun, in the open air, no fancy sets, no sound stages, and very little supplementary lighting to boot because extra fixed heavy equipment would make shots like this just impossible. But the flip side is all that freedom to move, to be dynamic, is huge. There's a reason Astor refers to his staging and blocking in Midsommar as choreography, a dance of the camera. For him, for his actors, Astor does a lot of takes to get things right, but not a lot of coverage to overcomplicate it. It's what allows for single shots, moving from one character to another, to be instrumental in establishing the geography and dynamics of those huge spaces. Like chess, it's now a total information game. We see everything, and so uncertainty isn't created by what's withheld from us, it's created by the ambiguity, the opaqueness, the excess of what's revealed to us. And we can compare all of this to the very different approach Astra and his DP took on Hereditary, their first feature film together. A literal night and day difference in how information is controlled and imagery presented. In Hereditary, the goal was to keep things as dark as they could get away with. Here, horror and dread are injected into us by rejecting our ability to see it. We plant pictures in our mind based on reactions, expression, typical of good horror using our imaginations against us. While Midsommar takes the opposite approach, a literally overexposed image overexposing us to long-held shots of tense, uncomfortable relationships, of very graphic imagery, a lot of which I can't show you here, but in general, this is the fundamental philosophy Midsommar took to its cinematography on all accounts. And these are cues taken from older films, like the original Wicker Man from 1973, a well-lit rural village setting, well-staged shots, lots of bodies to fill them, to say nothing of the thematic and visual comparisons. Or the use of color in Midsommar, a modern emulation of the three-strip technicolor look, inspired by films like Black Narcissus, not oversaturated, but vibrant and very well separated. All of it is almost antithetical to most horror. And in fact, in the words of Ari Aster himself, Midsommar isn't a horror film horror adjacent, but it isn't from the majority of mainstream horror that it takes its cues. Midsommar is, first and foremost, a fairy tale. A bright and twisted folktale. And it shows. Hey everybody. Today's video was brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service dedicated to elevating great cinema from all across the world. From iconic directors to emerging auteurs, Mubi's always got something new and amazing to discover. And that's because with Mubi, every film you see is hand-selected by a team of curators, real people, giving you access to the best of cinema at your fingertips, streaming anytime, anywhere. And if you want to check out more from the twisted world of Ari Aster, right now on Mubi you can watch his executive produced short film The Bones, or Los Huesos, a very eerie stop motion picture from two Chilean directors evoking a style reminiscent of very early Tim Burton and other expressionist works. You can watch The Bones or anything else streaming on Mubi for free with an extended 30 day trial if you go to mubi.com slash cinemasticks for a whole month of great cinema for free.